the day, the former Capitol Police chief joins us to react to footage of Nancy Pelosi contradicting her previous statements on January 6th. The CEO of the Tennessee Star will be on to explain his publication's release of the Covenant School Shooters Manifesto. And is Silicon Valley becoming mega country? We have all those stories and so much more. Blaze News Tonight starts right now. Welcome to the chaos. I'm Jill Savage. Today is Wednesday, September 4th. Last week, we discussed Nancy Pelosi's flip from taking responsibility for January 6th Capitol riots to blaming former Capitol Police Chief Stephen Sund. And Sund recently spoke out denouncing Pelosi's claim about the National Guard. Matthew Peterson is the editor in chief of Blaze News, and Stephen Sund is also here. He joins us now. So, Stephen, what really happened with Nancy Pelosi and the National Guard on January 6th? Well, thank you very much, both uh, Jill and Matthew, for having me on today. Uh, it's interesting when you look back at it and I see the video coming out, I've been waiting, you know, with all the news that Alexandra Pelosi was filming on that day, the report of it, I was waiting for some of that to get released. And now that's getting released, I think uh, it's going to be interesting. So the fact that she's coming out and she's saying she takes responsibility, she is, you know, the Speaker of the House, she has a lot of responsibility over the Capitol. But when you look at it and you look at the requirements they had in place for me to request assistance in advance and on January 6, um, they play a significant role. And let me get into that. Um, there's a law, it's called 2 U.S. 1970. It requires me as the chief of police to get approval of the uh, Capitol Police Board, which is the House and Senate Sergeant Arm and the architect of the Capitol, and congressional leadership to bring in any assistance for my men and women uh, in advance of an event. On January 3rd, in the morning of January 3rd, I went and specifically asked the House Sergeant Arms for the request of the National Guard and was denied. Denied specifically, one, he didn't like, like the optics of it, and he didn't think that intelligence uh, supported it. He referred me over to the Senate Sergeant Arms. When I went over to talk to him, they had already come up with an idea that they weren't going to approve it. They wanted me to just reach out to the National Guard and see if we needed them, how long it might take for them to get there, but they wouldn't approve it. So by law, I'm required to go to them. So that's a law that passed by Congress. So. They denied me on January 3rd, even on January 6th, while we're under attack. We become under attack at 1253 on the West Front. 1255, I call D.C. police, ask for assistance there. That's my old agency. I was with them for 25 and a half years. And then I call uh, Paul Irving at 1258 p.m. and ask for assistance of the National Guard to bring in federal resources, which I'm required by law to do. It took 71 minutes, 11 repeat calls uh, back to find out from the two Sarge Arms where we are on my request before they finally approved that request at 2.09 p.m. So now to hear her say that she bears some responsibilities, yeah, I think it's about time. I mean, this is just remarkable. Every time we hear about this, I get more interested, not less, and more upset, not less. Um, how would you describe the trajectory, though, the last three years? I mean, why is this winding, weaving path being taken and why has Pelosi, uh, you know, how has she changed over time? What do you think is going on? Um, again, I think their their main focus, and you see it in the video that's being released, is mainly the executive branch. Their focus is, uh, you know, blame on 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. My focus as the former chief of police, and when I started sitting down and, and just taking notes, I wasn't even planning on putting it together a book was to develop an after action or a critical incident review. So I'm looking at it from what's the nuts and bolts of what went wrong. I think they're looking at it from the political aspect. And it's the political aspect that ruining that ruins the policing of on Capitol Hill. If they if they left the politics out of it and let me do my job, we wouldn't be here talking right now. Can you explain how you were hamstrung on January 6th with all of the bureaucratic puzzle, the, the structure that you were required to go through and, and get that permission to make sure that you knew what was happening on that day? Yeah, I mean, and just for your viewers to, to realize, I'm in the command center. I'm sitting in a command center. It's a large um, blackened out room, video cameras all over, and video screens, watching the fighting taking place. And repeatedly, I'm picking up the phone because I'm required to get approval from the Capitol Police Board to bring in any resources. And, you know, when I couldn't get that approval after second, third, fourth call, I started calling every chief of police I could. So I started calling in police, even though I hadn't gotten authorization yet, 
I started calling in federal resources, started calling in Secret Service, even though they wouldn't give me any uh, any assistance. And what the the bad thing is is besides the DC police, which is the largest 3,800 people, uh, 3,800 member police department in the city, the next largest cadre of assistance I could get my officers was 190, uh, I'm sorry, 180 National Guard troops that were within eyesight of the Capitol. And for hours, I repeatedly called trying to get approval for them. Once I got approval at uh, 2.09 p.m., I thought I called William Walker. I called William Walker, the general, the, the commanding general of the DC National Guard, even before I got approval saying, please send me whatever you can. I called him at 149 before I got approval. I called him again at 209, 234. I'm on a call with the Pentagon. Pentagon wants to know why I need assistance. They're watching exactly what we're seeing on your screen on their big screen TVs, and they're asking why I need more assistance. It's it's crazy. They didn't send any help. I was on the call with him when we had the shooting of Ashley Babbitt. They didn't send any help for three hours and 19 minutes after that call. Why why do you think this happened this way this day? I mean, what's your your best uh, account for how this played out? Um, I think, you know, when you when you look at it, there's a lot of different ways of uh, slicing this one. But I think politics um, got too much into into security, even during the 2020 protests. And you look at it, the 2020 protests, you had a really bad protest over at the White House. Um, there's a lot of times that my security posture up on Capitol Hill was influenced and they tried to put pressure on me about having my troops in hard gear, uh, have metal barriers out uh, from my oversight uh, staffers, my oversight members of Congress. Uh, and I think they just allowed the security apparatus on the Hill to be t- become too politicized. When you have a law that affects uh, when a chief of police can call in resources, that's getting a little too crazy. I'm the only chief of police that I'm aware of in the United States of America that has a federal law that re- requires me to get permission from Capitol Peace Board and members of Congress to bring in any resources for my men and women. That's crazy. Who knows security best? A 25, 26 year veteran or staffers for a member of Congress? Can, can you describe what it's been like these last couple of years um, to, to go through this, you know, kind of post looking back assessment and then have to deal with what seems like being unfairly blamed often uh, by people in power. What's that, what has that been like personally? And, and what, what has happened there? Explain to people who have never heard this before uh, what, what's, what it's been like. Um, it is it has been personally uh, it's, it's been pretty rough, but the blame game started immediately. It's not like it's just coming out with the HBO video. You know, at 11 o'clock at night on the night of the 6th, I had a call with members of Congress and one of the members of Congress, Tim Ryan from um, uh, Ohio, was screaming at me um, about how come I didn't order my troops, my officers to open fire on the crowd. Think about that. Um, so he he's screaming at me. Pelosi goes on national TV on the 7th, calls for my resignation, says it's a failure of leadership at the top and says I never even spoke to her since the attack occurred. I called her three times. And spoke to her three times. So the blame game started from that point on. The thing I regret most is I wish I had fought more and didn't submit my resignation. Um, based, if I knew now, would I? If I knew then what I know now, I would have absolutely fought this all the way. Um, but it's been it's been physically, emotionally, mentally tough. But you know, I talked to the, I, I talked to Capitol Police, DC Police. I talked to police across the country almost every day. Um, the relationship I have with them and the mentoring back and forth has been extremely helpful. Uh, but it's, it's sad to just see, you know, the, um, uh, demeanor, uh, it's just, you know, the outlook of the officers right now is still, still kind of low up on the Hill. Um, and you know, I, I really, I still too, truly do care about the men and women of that department a lot. And I do miss them a lot. Stephen, our last question for you is what do you think that average people should know about January 6th and what happened that day? it could have absolutely been prevented. You know, when you look at the five uh, com- uh, committee reports and even the uh, the first report from the uh, Senate combined rules and, and Homeland Security um, hearing that they had in February of 2021 to the Senate, the select report, a uh, select committee, I'm sorry, to the uh, January 6th, uh, the current committee with uh, Barry Loudermilk, report after report after report says this was an intelligence failure whether it's from how the FBI, the DHS, or my own intelligence unit handled intelligence, if they had handled it correctly, this wouldn't have happened. There would have been fencing up, there would have been mutual aid, I would have gotten more support from the Capitol Police Board and members of Congress, and we wouldn't be here. So it absolutely was preventable. If people want more information about this, I mean, uh, uh, have you written, are you writing on this? Is there a place they can go to know more about your story? 
Yeah, I've, I, I've actually, I actually wrote a book, and again, I, you know, I've done so many after action reports and so many critical incident reviews. Um, I started writing, and I wrote probably seven, eight hundred pages. But I have a three hundred ninety-four page book out. It's uh, Courage Under Fire. It's on um, Amazon. You can get it on Amazon. It's through Blackstone Publishing. You can get it through there too. Uh, and it's again, it's about the ridicule myself and my officers got following January six. But it it puts everything together. It's been called the definitive after action on the Hill. It's been referenced in congressional reports. I can't believe I'm talking to you guys 44, almost 45 months later, and we don't have a more definitive after action report. And this is, I, my book's actually going down in history right now is, is probably the most accurate uh, accounting of what actually occurred on Capitol Hill on January 6th. Well, I'll, I would say look for Courage Under Fire, Under Siege, outnumbered 50, 58 to one. Yeah. I'll definitely be picking that up. Stephen, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Jill. Thank you very much, Matthew. And Matt, when you look at this, this is such an important topic. And the fact that we just got all the information that we did is astounding. Again, he said 45 months later. Yeah, look, I mean, like he said, people have been playing politics with this from the beginning, and it's shameful. I mean, He's not playing politics. He's just trying to tell the truth about what happened that day. And I don't think this issue goes away as long as people continue to use it as a political ramrod, which they are. So uh, we need to uh, continue to talk about this, to investigate it and to get to the bottom of it. And I know our audience is still interested because it's still being used as a political weapon, very sadly, by irresponsible people uh, who unfortunately run this country. And something else that our audience is definitely still interested in is the shooting in Nashville. We'll have the CEO of the Nashville Star explain why he decided to release the Covenant Shooters School Manifesto up next. Well, we know Americans are hurting financially and the health care costs are just completely out of control. And we all know that government isn't the answer. So what is? Well, Lassie Health is here to shake things up, and that's L-A-A-S-Y. And it's not health insurance, but it is the access to health care that you want without the red tape, the restrictions, the inflated costs. And the best part is coverage starts at just $30 a month. So with that, you can get your transparent pricing, the comprehensive coverage tailored to your needs and that of your families. It's the access that you want to health care services without breaking the bank. And there's no annual or lifetime cap on services. And you can start the plan at any time. You'll get over 400 prescription medications included. It'll include free unlimited virtual mental health care counseling, virtual 24-7 virtual urgent care, and a load off of lab testing, image testing, surgeries, and procedures. So Lassie Health is a game changer. Check out affordable plans that put you in control of your health care at healthylink.com slash blaze. For a limited time, get up to $100 off your first month for eligible plans. So get healthy, be healthy, and stay healthy without breaking the bank at healthylink.com slash blaze. As we discussed yesterday, the Covenant School Shooters Journal was published by the Tennessee Star. And the shooter's writings shed light on her poor mental state in the months leading up to the shooting. And here to discuss is Michael Patrick Leahy, the CEO of the Tennessee Star. So thank you so much for joining us. So what should Americans be taking away from the writings in this journal? This is a massive failure of our mental health system. And I think it's that failure, which we've documented in all of our reporting uh, since this tragedy, this tragic killing took place on March 27th, 2023, when uh, 28-year-old Audrey Elizabeth Hale, biological female who self-identified as a transgender male, walked into her former elementary school and murdered nine, three, three nine-year-olds and three staff members. And then a couple of minutes later, she was killed and turned by Metro Nashville Police Department. We've been trying to get these documents in court uh, really since May of 2023 with no success. In June of 2024, we legally obtained these documents from a source familiar with the investigation. And we began writing stories about it. We didn't publish it at that time because there were some uh, uh, legal challenges that we had to take care of. Uh, before we publish it. We finally resolved those challenges to our satisfaction. Uh, and then we published all 90 pages of the journal. 
she maintained for the last three months of her life, which she left in her vehicle and was recovered by Metro Nashville Police Department on the day of the murders. Michael, I want to get into the uh, the legal saga here and kind of the story of what, what you've gone through in the last few years. Um, but I, I also wanted to first talk about this in kind of a editorial type way. Um, the, the moral dilemma that people have gone back and forth with over the last few years. So just full disclosure, uh, here at Blaze Media, around the time, I believe, of the Parkland shooting, uh, it was decided not to publish, right, words from manifestos such as this. And when I look back, I think a lot of people uh, thought similarly at the time. I certainly would have. I feel, though, that something has changed in the intervening years. And in fact, as the article you saw on the screen earlier, uh, we did publish. We changed that policy. We, we are publishing, um, you know, snippets from the manifesto that, that you published. So I'm curious, you know, what what your thought process is on this and how you approach these things. And if you think anything has changed, you know, since Parkland and today. It's a good question. Uh, I'm a journalist. And if a document uh, should be available to the public, I want it, and I want to report on it. This is a matter of public interest. What is the motivation behind these uh, mass murders uh, committed by very troubled people? Uh, and what's the public policy solution to it? I think that's a very important part of the discussion. We believe that we have uh, served the public interest by demonstrating the very confused state of mind that Audrey Elizabeth Hale had uh, and the absolute total failure of the mental health system uh, to treat her for her difficulties. And in fact, uh, we've reported that she's been under psychiatric care at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. She was under that care for 22 years. She was also taking a very, uh, very uh, uh, strong SSRI drugs uh, since 2019. Those will have an impact on a person. And I think that that really the whole public discussion about this has been misdirected. Uh, they, they try to make it about gun control. The real issue here is how our children uh, are suffering from mental illness and not being treated properly and how they're being overprescribed with uh, psychiatric drugs. With that in mind, uh, you know, when you when you look at the, the 90 pages that you guys did publish from that journal, what was one of the, the things that really stood out to you and grabbed your attention and has stuck with you? Every page of her writing uh, told you a story. And the story is this was a young woman in great <laughs> psychological distress calling out for help. In fact, uh, a couple of uh, mental health professional therapists have looked at it uh, since the publication of it, and they all said the same thing. She was crying out for help, and she wasn't getting it. She hated herself. She hated her parents. She wanted to kill her father. Uh, she, she had suicidal ideation, and uh, she, she had this bizarre idea uh, that she was uh, born into the wrong body. She thought that she was a boy without a penis. And uh, that developed a whole series of disturbing, dark thoughts uh, in her mind. Uh, I want to uh, just applaud you for everything you've been through and what you've done. It's a it's a remarkable story. And, uh, you know, I hope and pray it ends well. I think it will. I think it already has. Um, I want you to talk about that, though, to our audience. I mean, explain what the last few years have been like. Our own Steve Baker, I know, was was out there um, to uh, to visit your trial uh, a year, a while back, right? Um, so so tell us, you know, give us that story of, of what you've been through and, and how this came about. So um, the story really is that we're just a, a journalistic organization seeking documents which uh, the public has a right to see. And at every level, the local government has obstructed those desires, as has the FBI. In fact, Metro Nashville Police Department has claimed for well over a year that the investigation is ongoing. They claimed in court in March it would be over by the, the end of June. Well, here we are at the beginning of September. They're still claiming it. It's basically a stalling tactic because they don't want this information out. This has really just been... It, 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 not that much heavy lifting except basic journalism until uh, in June uh, of uh, 2023, the presiding judge in the state case uh, 
with no basis of fact, uh, hauled me into court uh, on June 17th in a show cause hearing order uh, to explain to her why she shouldn't hit me with contempt of court charges. She claimed that perhaps there was a court order that she'd issued that I violated. There was no such order. When that hearing began and Steve Baker was in studio, was in the courtroom with me that very day, uh, he was in the audience, I was front and center, um, the, the, the judge refused to uh, address the issue that she said was a show cause hearing order. In fact, she went around the room and talked to everybody else, everybody else's attorney, and said, is there still an issue here to determine? Uh, when she finally got to my attorney after an hour and five minutes, he said, Your Honor, what's the underlying court order here that you're claiming may have been violated? Uh, you're not supposed to, we're not going to address that right now. <laughs> and he said, well, I've got this show cause hearing order right here that says address that. And she told him to sit down. And uh, so that was, you know, a, it was Kafkaesque, right? Right here in America. Well, we will be praying for you. Thank you so much for what you have done and what I'm sure you will continue to do with this story. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Michael. And when you look at it, it's free speech all yeah. over the world, right? And it's and it's right here in the United States. That's we, we, we take it for granted. But even with just court cases like this happening, yeah. you can't take that for granted. Yeah, I think what Michael said in the end is, is right. Is, is this is basic journalism or should be. Uh, and there were moments when it looked like maybe they weren't going to allow that to happen in this case, which is which would have been absolutely ridiculous uh, because we know they would have leaked it if the politics were different. So, look, this is why we send Steve Baker out there. This is why people subscribe to Blaze. This is what we do. This is absolutely what we do and bring you stories that other people are not willing to bring you. So Chris Bedford, though, he will come up next and give us the odds that the SAVE Act will survive in the Senate up next. Yesterday, Speaker Mike Johnson hinted at his plans to attach the SAVE Act to a short-term funding bill that would fund the government until March. The bill, which aims to prevent non-citizens from voting, could force a government shutdown due to Democratic opposition. Chris Bedford joins us now to discuss. So, Chris, you wrote about this in your Beltway brief today. So, what are the odds that the SAVE Act will survive in the Senate? Well, that depends on how strong the House representatives are, how strong Speaker Mike Johnson is. Uh, this is not a speakership that has been marked by bold moves. He's not been one previously to buck Mitch McConnell. But there is a different calculation here because Mitch McConnell leaves his head of the Republican Party in the Senate position after these elections. And Donald Trump wants this done. There's a pretty good chance that Donald Trump is the next president. So Mike Johnson has to sort of weigh that. The Senate likes to try to bully the House and just ignore what the House does until they come up with something that the senators say, well, we can work on this in a bipartisan manner. But really, that's just fancy talk for we can find out a way to spend a bunch of money because the Senate's got a special party within it, both Republicans and Democrats, that are appropriators. All they care about is getting along to see who can get the most money out the door, and they each get their own special projects. It's not as divided ideologically as the House. But if the House of Representatives picks this up, passes it, leaves town, says, we're not, this is it. You're shutting down the government if you can't figure out something with it. And if not, if you're not willing to do this, you need to explain to the American people why illegal aliens and non-citizens should not be actually barred from voting in federal elections. Well, I think that puts the Senate in a difficult position. And more so, it puts some of Chuck Schumer, the head Democrat, puts some of his more uh, uh, vulnerable incumbents in a difficult position where, well, you're trying to be a Democrat reelected in Ohio, which is basically red, except for one senator, or Montana, which is a strange state with conservative, but also libertarian and also kind of hippie political instincts. If you're one of those Democrats trying to win reelection, then you have to talk seriously about this illegal immigration problem because it is a problem in Ohio. It is a problem in Montana. And that alone is enough votes to try and sh uh, shift this fight. OK, let's let's focus on that right there. That alone is enough votes. Do you think there is a real chance that this thing passes then? It's possible. It's actually more possible than usual. I mean, a lot of things in D.C. that seem like they're very good on paper end up just being messaging votes. 
And let me be clear, even as a messaging vote, this is actually a pretty interesting piece to show that the Democrats are essentially for not trying to check IDs. Right now, the Democrats keep on saying it's already illegal to vote in federal elections if you're a non-citizen. Well, that's true. But people are barred from trying to verify that in any manner. It's all just you check a box and you say, yes, I'm a citizen. That's it. Now you can vote. There's no ID check. Forget about passports or things like that. So this law would change that. Uh, and Democrats, in order to, if the Republican House leaves town and says this is the bill, well, Democrats could still strip the SAVE Act from it. But in order to do so, they would need to have 51 votes in order to say, listen, we're pulling this part, which is in the text of the bill, out of it. We're going to get rid of it, and we're just going to vote on the on the actual budget, which goes until March, is the proposal right now. But in order to do that, they have to put Tester and they have to put Sherrod Brown on the record actually going for this. They have to put their vulnerable incumbents, unless Republicans, of course, help them. Now, that's not something right now that they want to do. So it puts them in quite a bind. Now, they could also just pass it and send it up and, 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 and have, let, let Joe Biden line item veto parts of it. But even that would be very bad messaging in the time of our election. And this is at a time where the ground has shifted so much in Washington that like Kamala Harris is running on finishing the wall. I mean, the American people, independents, but even Democrats are, up to, are, are done with the levels of illegal immigration we've seen over the last four years. Well, and that might play into uh, what we're going to talk about right now, because Labor Day is behind us. So we are fully on for the election in November. And in Nate Silver's latest Electoral College forecast, he has Trump actually gaining. Uh, it's 58-41 right now in favor of Donald Trump. So how accurate right now would you think that is? I think, you know, one of the better things you can go with is the betting markets, and that's similar. I think they're 52, 48 right now. Polls are extremely difficult to follow, but the Kamala Harris uh, burst of enthusiasm, if it seems fake to you, it seems fake to almost everyone you know, then it probably is fake. There's obviously a certain release of the incredible frustration and the fear that was just, the Democrats had for having to reelect Joe Biden. They knew that was a lost cause. So there was a big explosion of energy after Kamala Harris came out. But what has she actually done to change things? And you get a kind of a view of what the Democrats' internal polling is telling them based on how they're acting around the country. If you have people like David Axelrod, who still effectively works for Barack Obama, he doesn't technically, but he's very close in that orbit. I don't think he's lobbing bombs without Barack Obama's uh, implicit allowance. If you have him coming out there saying, well, this interview that Kamala Harris did where she didn't self-destruct or do anything is actually not enough because she didn't differentiate herself. She didn't push forward. This is a race that's hers to win, not hers to lose. Uh, well, that's a, that's a good sign that Democrats internally at the top recognize that this is still a very hard fight. Yeah, Chris, I mean, she has this slogan, you know, a, a new path forward, a new way forward. But um we already have spoken about this. She's part of the old administration. Like, what's the new path? Um, we've been publishing a recent article at Blaze, and we'll be publishing more on the lack of policy proposals, which is remarkable. I mean, uh, you know, talk to us about that. Can, how would you win a presidential campaign without any real policy proposals? Well, you just do it based on feelings. Honestly, that could work in the United States. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> So many voters just vote based on vibes and how they feel. One way you can really just measure that scientifically is how many people were dissatisfied or voted against Donald Trump who changed their vote because of how he made them feel and how the media coverage made them feel, who now sincerely regret that, who wish that Donald Trump was still president. That kind of shows you the power that vibes have. I mean, the vibes around President Barack Obama were so strong that he would finish a speech and everyone in the corporate media would say that was one of the greatest speeches we've ever heard. But I mean, there's really no one who can quote a great line from Barack Obama. There's not a he doesn't have an FDR or a JFK or a Ronald Reagan where there are lines that are left behind. It's just how it made you feel. It made you feel warm and, and fuzzy inside. And that's a lot what Kamala Harris is trying to do. And when you combine that, maybe maybe that wouldn't work against a Republican who was less divisive. But Donald Trump is one of the most divisive people in American political history at this level, at least in the modern times. 
that feeds into this. It, it feeds into Donald Trump. You may have been better, but did you feel good? And Democrats are counting on that because honestly, they're, they're, you, we saw in this last interview, their policies aren't good. Kamala Harris is basically echoing Donald Trump's policies from no tax on tips to child tax credit to reshoring industry to strong a strong country to all to law and order to I'm a prosecutor to she's literally saying finish the wall. So Democrat policies don't work. They really best just rely on vibes and let Time Magazine and Esquire and Salon sell it for them. No policies needed, but we'll be vibing with you tomorrow, Chris Bedford. Thanks so much. Can't wait. We'll tell you why big tech bros are starting to trend towards Trump when we return. Silicon Valley has historically supported the Democratic Party, but that's shifting now with Trump and his 2024 campaign. Here to discuss is James Polos, the Blaze TV host of Zero Hour. So, James, why is Donald Trump becoming more popular with the tech billionaires out there? Hey, Jill. Well, it's apocalypse now. I mean, a lot of these guys are starting to realize what uh, what some folks out of tech have been uh, banging on about for a while, which is there's a fork in the road. Uh, and down one road is uh, is big tech, is the, uh, the Silicon Valley super firms that are part of the military industrial complex, part of the intelligence community, part of uh, whether you call it the blob like uh, Ben Rhodes did or the Borg like I like to do. And if, if you're anywhere outside of that immediate circle, no matter whether you're a billionaire or you're a VC or whatever you are, uh, you do not get a seat at what they're trying to create as this kind of table where they decide what the new regime of the United States of America is going to be. So some of these guys, uh, they're, they're starting to realize what's going on. They've seen its impact in their own lives and uh, they're taking the plunge. James, it really is remarkable. I mean, it's something that we used to talk about and talk with some of these people over the years. Um, and to see this kind of snowball in the way it has, uh, when you look around the room and, and kind of see, count off all the names, for instance, some of the names mentioned in this article, uh, there's a lot of people all of a sudden coming together uh, and actually supporting Trump, which is you know the most controversial thing you could do. So, so what do you make of this? I mean, it, it seems like even people like Ben Horowitz, who is the uh, definitely the more known as the liberal, right, and Horowitz Andreessen, is under fire for this, and you know, sort of standing up and and taking heat for this decision. I find that very interesting. How far do you think this goes? Does it continue to grow? Uh, are people going to back down? I think it goes all the way. I mean, this is really for all the marbles. I think people realize around the world that the outcome of this election is going to be geopolitically significant. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, whether it's Andreessen Horowitz or, or Peter Thiel, I, you know, you got lots of guys going on all the podcasts. Uh, Eric Weinstein is just on um, on Rogan, uh, Thiel on Rogan, uh, uh, Donald Trump on Lex Freeman. It's all popping off right now. And, uh, you know, I think you got to credit at least some of that to Baron Trump, who's out there. He's uh, about to become an NYU student. And, uh, you know, Zoomer power here, uh, uh, definitely has the the ear of his father, um, and uh, whether it's Trump at the Bitcoin conference or some of these other indicators, I mean, we really have to recognize the fact that that post World War II order, that world order uh, that's been going on for so long, it's really out of gas. A lot of it's in the rearview mirror. You look at what's going on in the UK, Austria, uh, uh, Australia, Canada. I mean, this is not. Uh, your granddaddy's uh, Anglosphere or, or Western alliance. And obviously we want the United States to be strong and we want to stand up for our allies and all that good stuff. Uh, but gosh, the world has changed. And uh, I think this uh, influx of uh, interest of real, you know, tech leaders who, uh, who, who, who value competence and uh, value uh, uh, ambition applied to good use, uh, looking toward the Trump campaign is really uh, kind of the only option. You mentioned the Bitcoin conference and the Winklevies. The Cameron and Tyler Winklevoss, the twins, have both given a million dollars to Donald Trump. And so I ask you, what do you think the role of crypto has been playing in all of this tech movement towards Donald Trump? Yeah, I mean, there's, you know, there's there's been an effort for some time uh, to figure out in Silicon Valley how to create a viable alternative to uh, the sort of Federal Reserve Wall Street nexus. Uh, a lot of Americans have had a problem with the way that's worked out for the, the ordinary man here in this country for a long time. Uh, of course, if you're coming at it from the, the tech industry, you're seeing a potential business opportunity here, too. No bones about it. Uh, and then there are these lingering questions about, well, hey, wait a minute, where does cryptocurrency come from? Uh, at the end of the day, did, did it kind of come from 
uh, the cryptographers in the NSA or, or British intelligence or somewhere. Uh, nobody really knows. Uh, Satoshi Nakamoto is still still sort of a mystery man uh, if he's even just one person. Uh, but look, you know, this is a technology, one of the top level digital technologies that ordinary Americans can use right now to uh, work together peer to peer to create uh, markets for culture, for goods and services uh, that do kind of run an end, uh, as do an end run around that increasingly concentrated and corrupt uh, financial and economic system uh, that a lot of us, you know, we just have to struggle through it every day. It's become a fact of life, but uh, I think a lot of people want to change that. And so, you know, uh, heaven forbid that a, a cultural commercial movement form in this country uh, that uh, that takes advantage of these opportunities uh, to actually grow, uh, grow businesses and, and build some wealth. I think uh, that's going to be a powerful force. And uh, I think right now it's pretty firmly behind Donald Trump. So one thing that you think a lot about, uh, we all think a lot about, is is the you know the, the discourse trademark, uh, the narrative trademark that is falling apart every day around us. Um, but give 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 a kind of fifty thousand foot level. What do you think this means? These guys coming out so publicly um, for public discourse going into the election, and as a subset of that. Do you think that uh, censorship is going to increase or, or decrease in route to Election Day in November? Well, I think in most places, censorship is only going to uh, to increase. And in fact, uh, compulsory speech is going to increase. It's no longer enough to simply refrain from saying the things that the censors don't want you to say. Uh, you are suspect and targeted and tracked if you do not stand up and raise your hand and uh, pledge allegiance. Uh, say the right words, uh, stick the right stickers on your uh, on your social media accounts and all that. Uh, but you know what's what's really going on here for fifty thousand feet. I think is you know the, the big geopolitical reset. You got uh, the great reset people out there trying to create a new world order, a new new world order. You know because the 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 old new world order only lasted for a decade or so. Um, you got uh, some really kind of radical critics of uh, of America um, saying you know no we need uh, some other big country to be in charge of of uh, world affairs maybe. China, you know, maybe maybe all the all the European and post uh, sort of you know uh, uh, post European colonies are, are toast, and we gotta gotta look to Eurasia. Um, you know, the, the not super influential, I don't think, relative to the folks in the middle who are saying like, well, wait a minute, you know, we love America, uh, we don't want to be the losers, uh, we want to have some influence over uh, the the shape of the world to come, uh, but we don't want uh, a, a bench clearing brawl with uh, with Russia and China. Uh, we, world war is bad, you know, we want to avoid that, uh, and I think there's a recognition among lots of Americans uh, at all levels, uh, socioeconomic levels, that uh, right now our system and our country are very fragile, and if we make the wrong move and and if we get sucked into the wrong kind of competition or this sort of all or nothing mindset, uh, then we are going to stumble into a kind of global uh, uh, conflagration. It doesn't have to be a nuclear war, lots of other ways of uh, devastating countries and wiping out billions of lives. Uh, and that ought to be avoided. And in order to avoid that, you got to take some of these other big countries on the block seriously, and you got to work with them to avoid uh, a sort of international meltdown. We've seen this happen before. It happened with the world wars. Uh, you can be all in favor of America having won uh, the, the world wars and still not want another world war. I think Donald Trump's best tweet from a while back when North Korea was hot was uh, when he said, I'm just trying to stop the world from killing itself. Who could be against that? Uh, so I think a lot of these tech guys who are interested in, uh, you know, pushing pushing ahead with innovation and, and making some money while they're doing it, um, ultimately, you know, for a long time, it seemed like if you're a warmonger, if you want more war, it's because you see it as a great business opportunity. And, uh, you know, right now, I think a lot of those uh, techies who are going into the kind of uh, weapons business, a lot of those guys are focusing on defensive weapons, uh, which is maybe, you know, re reflects a sort of change in, in the perspective uh, and an interest in, uh, in finding a way, ultimately, uh, to get along peacefully, um, if not, you know, saying kumbaya with those other great powers around the world. Well, there's still plenty of room on the bandwagon, James. Thanks so much for joining us. And Peterson, when we look at it, it is such a huge topic. This is such a big push for the election this year. Yeah, and this is why return. I mean, James has been at this for a while. We have uh, we have this vertical and this lovely blue sign behind you uh, and this brand because we know how important tech is and we've been following it for a while and there's just no other organization out there and media on the right that does what we do. And so we're aware of it. We're tracking it. And if you join us, uh, this is why people subscribe to return. And the fun will continue because our next guest will explain one of the more polarizing articles on the blaze.com after this.
things that have never been done before. TheBlaze.com recently ran a piece titled A Warning to Black Pillars that consisted of that four-second video promoting Donald Trump 2024. Now, needless to say, this caused a lot of confusion. So here to explain all of this is the author of the article, Blaze Media Digital Strategist, Logan Hall. So, Logan, uh, explain what blackpilling is. Yes, uh, this article caused a lot of confusion. So because it was uh, only the four-second video, Logan. Yes, it did. That's why. Yes, it did. So let me clarify. I was well, one of the people. Chief, let me qualify. Article. I was one of the people confused. <laughs> Uh, let, so let me clarify. So this was uh, very short and sweet and to the point, yeah. maybe to a fault. Uh, I don't think so. But <laughs> what blackmailing is essentially is this doomed nihilistic worldview that there is nothing you can do to improve yourself or your situation. So you see a lot of this going around online with uh, you, you see like, oh, th but they're just they've already destroyed the country. There's no coming back. There's nothing we can do. And uh, this this worldview essentially just discourages people from bettering themselves and their country and their community. And so I wanted to just put out something that says, hey, we don't have to be like this. There's no point in blackpilling. It's not people say, oh, it's so over. And then we're back. This the, the black pill is essentially saying it's so over forever. You know, and so and so I wanted to uh, to push back on that narrative a little bit. So explain. I mean, we could go back to that graphic of uh, the this is the online graphic of the person who is black pilled. Yes. Um, just to explain <laughs> what this imagery means. I mean, it's sort of self-explanatory. Uh, but online, this is someone who is black pilled. Right. Yes. Yes. This is very much an archetype of uh, someone that does a, a certain type of poster that does exist. And he's just sitting there in a barren wasteland. The doomer. Right. He's a doomer. Yes. And so. So he essentially he thinks, you know, the, the situation is beyond fixing. There's nothing you can do to save America or save your country. Uh, it's just like a it's just like a he's just going through an apocalyptic wasteland waiting for things to be terrible. And so, you know, I, I, I don't want to uh, I don't want to like say, oh, this was some genius article or whatever. But you see way too much of this online where. Uh, and the reason I, I think the, the big reason that I did write this was that uh, a month and a half ago, President Trump took a bullet to the head, survived, stood up in front of the crowd chanting, fight, fight, fight. And on the heels of the most positive, the best news cycle that we could have for our side and for our candidate, you have all these People who are supposedly right wing conservatives who are arguing over abortion, they're they're arguing over whether or not J.D. Vance is weird. It's like, guys, you, you don't have to let people set the narrative for you like this. Your president just survived an assassin's bullet. And you sh this is the biggest like mandate of heaven indicator in history. It's like the most iconic photo ever. And you're going to allow the left to dictate terms to you like this. Like, quit it. Yeah. So that essentially was my warning in that article was we are going to do things to the black pillars that have never been done before. <laughs> Stop <laughs> black pilling. Stop black pilling. Well, there was another article, though, on The Blaze that was highlighting like the civility and politics. And they said Trump, you know, he didn't he didn't start it. He's not the one that is out there to blame. So, Logan, what role does social media play in shaping this public perception? Yeah, I think uh, I think social media has a lot of has positive and negative uses. I think for the divide in our country and for partisanship, it's probably not great. Uh, but, you know, they the left started this. They've started censoring people. They banned the sitting president from the Internet. It, I mean, if you remember in 2020, they banned Trump from the Internet. They suspended yeah. his account. They tried to unperson him. So uh, they know that these tactics, these tactics are effective. And uh, I don't think Trump is really to blame for that. Yeah, it's interesting, like the, the pill right, goes all the way back to the matrix. And are you going to accept the red pill or the blue pill? Yes. And the red pill would be you're going to see reality outside the bounds of uh, the media uh, the media's propaganda. So for a lot of older people who maybe aren't online, they would fully agree with this imagery because they know that the TV lies to you uh, and they know that the media is against them. And so taking the red pill 
uh, has meant for the last however many years, waking up to what's going on around you, the black pill would be a, a pill that makes you uh, a doomer and you think everything's going to hell in a handbasket, as, as well, you know, look, a lot of people are tempted to think every day. And your message is, no, go ahead and fight. And when it comes to the public discourse and Trump and this blaming for the decline, right, we, we don't see that. Do we have the other meme yeah, uh, of the, the left? Everyone I don't like is Hitler meme. Yeah. Because that's, I mean, that's exactly what we're talking about right now, Logan. Yes, it is. And, uh, you know, they, they, they say their entire opposition is all right-wing extremists. It's all right, MAGA extremism. Yeah. They say the fringes have taken over the Republican Party. On the contrary, I think the Republican Party has, I mean, it has shifted, uh, but nowhere near in the direction of where, like, oh, all the MAGA people have taken over. That's just not true if you spend any time observing this. And and I think, uh, you know, the left has they create the conditions for what they say that they fear the most. So they they say that, oh, all these scary Christian conservatives are are just like roaming the country, being terrible in the middle of the country. And yet, you know, if they wanted things to be normal, they probably wouldn't be trying to imprison their chief political rival right now. <laughs> I mean, the, right now they're doing this. It's not like uh, it's not like some. This is some. If he loses the election, he's going to prison. They're going to try to put him in prison in a few weeks. I believe is his sentencing. So yeah. September 18th. Yeah, and so they want that imagery. They want that as a warning to the American people that if you try to challenge the system legitimately through the electoral process, that they will punish you if they disagree. Right. And what's so ridiculous about this? What I love about that meme, which uh, originally is a little golden book, but there's probably copyright issues yeah. with that because <laughs> uh, they show a little golden yeah. book just like this, a little golden book you remember as a kid. And and the point everyone I, I don't like as Hitler is that this is the left's guide to political discussion. They are the most uncivil people ever who only can call Trump Hitler. And the hilarious thing about that, as we all know, is Trump was the, he was already president and he was the worst Hitler ever. <laughs> you know, moving the moving the capital, recognizing the capital of Israel's is Jerusalem like he was a terrible Hitler. He was really bad at being Hitler. Uh, so so this is but this is the way that they argue. And it's interesting how, um, you know, our side uses these memes that you've been explaining to us. Yes. Yeah. Now, Peterson, Logan is part of our social media team. And while he's not going to be part of off the record tomorrow, you and I are going to be. And for that, yes. that is for the Blaze TV subscribers only. So it's going to be tomorrow night at 530 Central, 630 Eastern. And they, the viewers, can ask us the questions. Oh, yeah. So AMA, as they say online, is ask that it? me <laughs> anything. Ask me anything. Uh, we'll talk about what, whatever the heck you want to talk about. I look forward to doing it. And, uh, you know, I have to say, like, shows like this, events like we're going to have tomorrow, this is what makes Blaze Blaze. This is why people subscribe. And if you haven't, we, we could really use your help. You should, too. Yeah, it's going to be at blazetv.com slash off the record. And you can use the promo code off the record for a discount on your subscription and never miss an episode of Blaze News Tonight, which I know everybody is out there trying to get it downloaded on their po favorite podcast platform. Because and then, of course, if you go and rate and review the show, it's going to help us get all those subscribers. Let's go. Let's go. That's going to do it for us here on Blaze News Tonight. We'll see you back here tomorrow.